Welcome to the second part of week two. From now on, I'm going to introduce basics. In those slides, you're going to uh, see some major statistics that can be used in the process of uh, individual diagnosis. It's uh, basics. So maybe for some of you who already took some courses in stats or methods, maybe it's redundant. But still, I do believe that's important to, this, to do this kind of recap. So what are you going to do in the second part? I'm going to focus on uh, reliability of personality measures. Then I'm going to discuss validity of personality measures in personal selection. That would be another video clip. And then I will focus on corrections of validity coefficient, along with some advanced topic in personnel selection. Those three major elements, reliability, validity, correction, and advanced topics, they form three different video clips that will be distributed via Canvas. OK, uh, let's start from uh, this basic example. As you see, um, we have pictures of uh, different um, people. So we have American president, we have Sigmund Freud, and we have a famous painter, Vincent van Gogh. You can ask a question if you see those uh, pictures, if you know what they did in their life, what kind of outcomes they did um, achieve whether there's a relationship between their um, handwriting and their character. Some people think that there is a link between those two elements, between personality or character and handwriting. Some people think that handwriting is a good indicator of specific traits and can be helpful in predicting how people can uh, behave uh, in a work context. Is it Really the case, is handwriting a good predictor of work behavior? Let's see what information is available. Here you can see uh, validity uh, for specific methods that can be used for personal selection. So um, in different organizations, people are interested in uh, diagnosis of specific traits, specific abilities, knowledge that uh, is relevant to specific uh, position at the company. So um, here it's the level uh, of validity of specific methods like interview, uh, reference letters or assessment tenor. We also have here personality traits. Here on the very end, we have a prediction that is based on uh, handwriting. So as you see, relationship between handwriting style and uh, overall validity, it's very, very low. It's almost uh, zero. Of course, you can argue to what extent this 0.02 correlation is sensible, but still, we would rather consider it as uh, this method as not useful. Of course, it's also not negative, so it means that if you would base your prediction based on uh, this value, at least you will get some positive effects. It's really, though, it's really not accurate method of predicting uh, work behavior. So thus, validity is really low. On the other hand, we have, uh, for instance, methods like interview. So as you see, uh, prediction that is based on interview can be really, really accurate. In the middle, we have personality uh, tests, but also we have capaci capacity tests. Uh, in this case, it's a, a data from a Dutch research. We see that relationship between those methods and work performance is relatively high because the correlation is 0.51. There are some differences here on this graph, because we have bars uh, 
blue and black. Blue bar is for specialist. Black bar is for managers. So you can ask a question why there are so much differences between specialist and managers in terms of how well we can predict uh, work behavior or work performance depending on capacity test. Let's discuss that in Q&A session. Okay, let's move on. Another question that we can ask, what other methods can be used in personnel selection? Hopefully you will learn uh, later on within the course that also more advanced methods can be used uh, to predict um, work behavior that can be used in personnel selection. For, for instance, currently we use uh, either situational judgment tests that help us to uh, closely look at specific skills that, that can be important for specific job positions, or we can use even more complex information, let's say gathered based on bio data. Probably you've noticed that I've used terms low or average or high correlation terms here. Those indications are based on uh, cotton standards and throughout the course we are going to use some of the standards. So I hope that you will understand what does it mean a cotton standard when uh, it comes to describing uh, validity of a specific um, method. Those standards are used also by, by the Dutch uh, Psychological um, Association and it's relevant for those of you who would like to get some practice uh, within Dutch companies um, in order for example to do uh, individual diagnosis. Those standards are based on classical test theory, CTT. So please remember that when I will be using this term CTT that will reflect this theory, classical test theory. So when we create a specific test, we take into account a um, number of elements. So for instance, we take into account quality of test material. What does it mean quality of test material? Uh, it's related to, for example, how instruction is uh, formed, what kind of items are used, what's the validity of specific items, what's the construct validity, and many more. Also, when we talk about quadrant standards, we take into account the quality of manual. A test manual includes all relevant information that can be used for individual diagnosis. So our sensible test user needs to know what's in the test manual. Also, a good test includes a manual, something that can be used in individual and in organizational diagnosis. Also, cotton standards, they indicate that if a specific test needs to be used in practice, it has to be based on standardization and norms. So a test user needs to know how to apply this test. So it's related to specific standardization of test use and also should be able to base diagnosis on norms. So when it comes to individual diagnosis, we typically base our diagnosis on norms. A good test has also evaluation of reliability. At this point you need to remember that reliability is not a characteristic of a specific test because reliability comes from different sources. So our overall outcome in reliability is an outcome of person 
a situation and also qualities of specific tests. So when you read a, a test manual and you know reliability, that's a reliability of the measurement, so the use of specific tests. On the other hand, validity, in this case specific type of validity, construct validity, is a characteristic of a test. So we can say that specific test measure what it should measure uh, and thus it has a high construct validity. This can be estimated, for instance, based on a statistical analysis, like factor analysis. Another type of validity is criterion validity. This type of validity is assessed in research. So for instance, we can be interested in predicting specific mm, work behaviors based on a test. If we predict that specific test should predict positive or high performance and we obtain this kind of results, we can claim that the specific test has a high criterion validity. Okay, let's take a look at an example of an instrument that some people use really often at companies. And let's see whether it's a test that meets all cotton standards. This test, it's probably known to you, it's a MBTI test. It's a test that measures 16 different types uh, of people based on combination of the following uh, dimensions. So extroversion, sensing and intuition, thinking, feeling, judging versus perceiving. So the question is that, is that really a good test? Shall we use it in practice? The authors of the test, they propose that based on those dimensions, we can uh, create specific types of personality. So we have uh, introverted sensing type and many more. Does it really make sense? Does it really meet scientific cotton standards? Let's take a look at the quality of the test. So in this Dutch summary of this test, based on this we can read that this method is not a good method. Why is that? Because specific type of um, test quality, so for instance validity, are not sufficient. They've been not properly tested. And of course it's just a one country study. But of course this kind of lack of psychometric quality was also found uh, in other versions of the test. Even though this test is really popular and maybe sooner or later you will see that some people use it uh, at the company, they should, uh, they should not use it. They should not use it because this test was not properly validated. So we do not know what's validity of this test. Even though some people tried to validate it, but it's obvious based on the data that you see on my screen uh, that the test has insufficient uh, validity. So the use should be mm, uh, actually forbidden. Okay, so that's an example of a specific test. Let's take a look in detail on what other specific characteristics can be identified in a test. When we assess reliability, we focus on measurement. So reliability is related to the use of a test. It's not a characteristic of a test itself, but it's a aspect of a measurement. What's the definition? A basic definition is here. Reliability is consistency of a measurement repeated within a person or in a sample. As you see, to assess reliability, we have to use a specific instrument, in this case, a 
few items at least repeatedly within a person. So the same person needs to respond to a few items, not two, not three, but typically it's way more than this. What we know from uh, CTT is that each measurement is not identical. Thus, a simple format for a test score is x equals t plus e. What do symbols mean? Let's take a look. First of all, when we assess reliability, to some extent we measure true score, which is t. But it's never known because it's not possible to accurately estimate e, error. It's just simply estimated, but it's never 100% accurate. We just get some information, we get some data, and based on, that, on this, we just think what's the level of, um, of the true score and what can be the level of the error. But because we repeat multiple times, so we use one instrument that consists of multiple tasks or multiple items, then based on this repeated measurement, we are closely uh, estimating um, a true score of a specific test. So the higher is the consistency between our score tests, then we can properly estimate a true score. That's why many of the tests, they have multiple items or multiple um, parts, multiple, let's say, sub-assignments, if we use a performance test. Situations in this case can be even more complex because when we estimate an error, we take into account multiple sources of error. One of the aspects of uh, measurement error is uh, accidental measurement errors, something that can be unpredictable. Uh, think about something that can happen when you use a test. What can that be? What can be an unpredictable aspect of the measurement? It can be a time of the day, it can be something that happens uh, throughout the measurement procedure, uh, a behavior of a test user or a person, something that happens within a person, let's say a headache, something that a test user or of course a course manual uh, or a test manual cannot uh, predict. Also, we can identify systematic measurement errors, something that can be considered as a constant. So it can be a specific element of a test. So it can be bad item. So if specific test is used multiple times, then we have systematic measurement error because the item, if the item is multiple times, then we can get the error again and again. And now try to think about your own example. What can be this systematic constant measurement error? Okay, let's move on. In person action process, uh, there are multiple sources of error. That can be environment, that can be environment uh, because we can perform diagnosis in a group or we can perform uh, diagnosis individually. That can be uh, sources in the candidate, so we uh, all know those of us who were applying uh, for a job that getting a job can be really stressful. We need to go through a complex process, thus uh, stress increases and to some extent, in some cases to great extent, um, that can uh, heavily influence our uh, performance. Also, there are other sources, like for instance, uh, examiner, a person who 
distributes, uh, administers the test, uh, he or she can also influence estimation of a uh, true score. Let's do a brief example related to reliability, a brief assignment. When it comes to individual diagnoses, we cannot be sure what's the true score. So we can only estimate what's, what's the true score. In order to calculate this aspect, in order to estimate a true score, we need to know important term, which is confidence intervals. This confidence intervals allow us to show in what kind of intervals the specific measurement can be allocated. What's the formula for confidence interval? As you see on my screen, confidence interval is a specific score plus minus standardized score multiplied by a standard error. So x is a score of a specific person. Then we have standardized coefficient and a standard error. And this formula can be used to identify where a true score of a specific person can be allocated within. Based on statistics, based on classical test theory, we assume that there are three types of standardized coefficient. We have the 0.99, 0.96 and 0.2.58. As you see here, there are differences between those three values. The higher the value, the more precise is the estimation, but as a consequence, the wider are the confidence intervals. In an individual diagnosis, that's important we are, in most cases, interested in estimating the allocation of a true score. Okay, that's important for individual diagnosis. You have to remember that confidence intervals, they indicate some specific boundaries, limits, within which a certain possible, in this case a true score, can be assumed. Let's take a look at an assignment. In this assignment we want to see how we can calculate a true score. It's basically a standard deviation or raw scores that can be around a true score. So in other words is a standard deviation of measurement error. According to this CTT, we assume that for each person, this standard error is equal. So when we use uh, item number one, item number two and three and so on and so on, uh, then the standard error for all those measurements is equal. Of course, it's just an assumption. Okay, so what do we need to calculate it? Of course, we need standard deviation, or in other words, sigma, of the overall score, and we need to use reliability of the measurement. In this case, the symbol is Rxx. And the formula in this case is uh, that the standard error equals standard devi deviation multiplied by a square root of one minus reliability value. Thus, based on this formula, we can say that the higher is the reliability, the lower is standard error, which means that more reliable is a specific measurement, the lower is a standard error. 
So the lower is the error of specific measure. Also, based on this formula, we can say that the lower is the standard deviation, so the lower is the distribution of the measurement error, also the lower is standard error. What would be standard error if the reliability would be 1? What do you think? Let's discuss that in a Q&A session. Let's do more mathematical uh, assignment. In this assignment, I will show you how to calculate uh, in confidence interval. So let's say that Edward scored 4 on the MND3 exam. You can ask a question, did Edward learn hard enough? What do we need for, for this answer? We need some input. The score of Adam is not enough because we need to know what's the uh, st uh, standard deviation of scores in this test within the whole group of students. And of course, we need to know what's the reliability of the whole test. How reliable was each question that was used for the exam. In this case, reliability is 0.18. For this case, we are going to use a formula that I've introduced uh, on the second slide. So we know that the standard error is sigma multiplied by square root 1 minus reliability. And we know also from one of the previous slides that confidence intervals equals score. In this case, it would be 4.0 standard, uh, standardized score and standard error. Resolution is pretty simple. We use given numbers. First, we calculate standard error based on the first formula. In this case, the standard error is 0.89. And then we just take into account Z, which is 1.96. And based on the formula, plus minus, we conclude that the values are as following. When you take into account 95% of confidence interval, so uh, it's a value that it's related to z-score, standardized score that was used. So the 95% confidence interval is 2.96, that's the lower, and the upper is 5.74. If to pass the exam, minimum grade would be 6, we can conclude that probably Edward was not studying hard enough because his true score can be between those two values, between 2.26 and 5.74. So we can say that he should study way, way harder. Similar assignments can be due when you, for example, are interested in individual diagnosis with an organization. So a specific uh, person, a specific candidate gets a specific score and you can use this confidence interval concept in order to calculate more or less what would be this person a true score. That's a really, really useful tool. That's one of the aspects of reliability. Another aspect is related to reliability coefficients. Here you will see uh, how we can estimate reliability. There are multiple ways to do that. First of all, we can use a test-retest approach. It means that a specific assignment, specific test, performance test, or a questionnaire can be used multiple times, at least two. And then we calculate correlation between the first test and the retest. And the outcome of this correlation is an estimation of reliability. We can also create parallel or alternative versions, and if both versions are used, we can correlate results from individuals, and then based on that, we can conclude a value which indicates, 
which indicates uh, probability. We can also calculate internal consistency. This assumes that a test is used one time. So we can uh, calculate split half reliability. We can calculate Krampus alpha or KR20, depending on multiple outcomes. We can also calculate Rater's coefficient. So for instance, when we are interested in consistency in responses within specific groups or consistency within reactions for a specific group or a team, we can calculate interclass correlation, ICC. Why we should know what reliability is and how we can calculate reliability coefficient? We need to know that because that influences how we validate methods. And to validate methods properly, we need to know what are the options to calculate co uh, reliability coefficient. Also, if you read um, test manual, based on uh, information about reliability, you can as assess to what extent specific method is good for research or to what extent is good for practice for individual diagnosis. That gives you an overall estimation of the quality of specific method. This uh, graph in indicates what kind of reliability coefficient we should calculate, what kind of methods we can use depending on measurement or a scale that can be used for uh, for this purpose. First of all, when you think about assessing reliability, take into account how many measurements were done or can be done. So for instance, if only one measurement is possible, then you would take a look at the left part of this graph. Another aspect of this tree is uh, what kind of scale was used in order to collect uh, data. So for instance, a scale can be dichotomous, so uh, zero or one, so no and yes responses, or can be quasi-interval. In this case, for example, Likert scale can be considered as quasi-interval. If you have a dichotomous scale, so for instance, one specific response is incorrect, another response for uh, one of the items is correct, then you would use KR20. But also, some people say that in this case, Kronzbach, Kronbach's alpha is also fine. You can do a split half as well. If you have a Likert scale, you would calculate Kronbach's alpha or a split half. On the other hand, if you have two measurements, or you can plan for your own research two measurements, then you can estimate reliability based on test readers version. If you have a lot of money, if you have a lot of time, you can not only have two measurements, but also you can have two parallel versions. When you would use two parallel versions? When it's useful? It's closer than you think. Because in education, like for example our exams, very often have Perl versions. So uh, to test students' knowledge, some of us we prepare Perl versions of a test and each version can be even used more than once in order to calculate to what extent specific test is reliable, how well it estimates a true score. Another important problem is related to some aspects of the measurement. So let's think that you give your participants only a few seconds to react. Would you calculate reliability? Or a specific questionnaire has multiple dimensions. Would you calculate reliability coefficient for the whole test? 
Or maybe you would calculate reliability for dimensions. What do you think? Let's discuss that in a Q&A session. The most commonly used reliability coefficient is alpha coefficient. Why is that? Because it can be applied if we have only one measurement. In many cases, when you use a specific test, even if we validate the test, we have access only to one measurement. We cannot ask the same group of people for multiple um, measures. So, typically we end up with one single measurement. That's why, that's why alpha is very useful. So, um, it needs multiple items. In order to estimate, we need a few values. We need uh, covariances of the items, and of course, we need to know how many items we can calculate. The formula is more or less like this. So it takes into account number of items, and also it takes into account uh, variance of the items, and overall measurement variance. Knowing that, you also need to remember that there is a specific interpretation of uh, alpha coefficient. In this case, reliability is a characteristic of a measurement. It's never a characteristic of a method. So when an alpha coefficient is calculated, according to Colton standard, values below 0.80 are insufficient. What it means? It means that if you'd like to use this specific test, and typically in research it gives reliability under 0.80, it's not sufficient for individual diagnosis. So it does not give you a, a good estimation of a true score. It's okay, it's sufficient, when the values are between 0.80 and 0.90. And without hesitation, you can use it if typically in research, um, this uh, test that you want to use gives values uh, 0.80 or higher. According to Colton standards, that's appropriate for individual diagnosis. Of course, we have the problem of dimensions. What you would say is that alpha coefficient should be rather calculated for individual dimensions. It should not be calculated for measurement for a scale that has multiple dimensions. Also, you need to remember that if validity is low or validity is close to zero, reliability may not be so meaningful. Very often, when we, for example, create a new measure, our reliability values are lower than 0.80. It's honestly, it happens very often. So what we should do with this kind of measures, instruments, tests? Should we get rid of them? Of course not, because if we want to use them for research, it's perfectly fine if those values are even 0.70 or even 0.60. But if they are lower than 0.18, the use of this test should be done with cautious. As you may see based on this slide, there is a relationship between validity and reliability. Let's take a look at validity first. That will help us to understand why there is a link between both constructs or characteristics of a test. <coughs> 